Yep, okay. Uh, right. Mr. President, Excellencies, and uh, guests and students, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to RGSL. I'm Adam Czarnota, I'm director of this, of, of this school. Uh, we in the RGSL celebrate 25th anniversary and decided to <coughs> organize a series of uh, 25th anniversary lectures. The first lecture will be delivered by the Mr. President of Latvia, Mr. Eglis Levitz, on the very timely issue, topic of uh, international responsibility of, of Russia. And, and other lectures will be followed in May, June, and in September by the very distinguished, other very distinguished speakers. As to the format of today's meeting, this uh, meeting in this talk will be broadcast online, and uh, I hope that after the talk of Mr. President, there will be some short time for Q&A, questions and answers. Thank you very much, welcome, and Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Rector, Excellencies, uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, would like to discuss today with you some issues of international law, especially responsibility, state responsibility in general, but uh, special uh, responsibility of Russia for the war against uh, Ukraine. Uh, first, some remarks on, uh, on international law, and then uh, I will uh, go to uh, the problem of uh, special tribunal, and uh, at the end, I will discuss uh, the issue of damages and reparations. So first, the international law. Uh, you have here several courses of international law, I assume. There are. So then you know that uh, the sources of international law are, in the first place, uh, international agreements between states or international conventions, this is one, uh, one source. Second, part, uh, second source, uh, uh, customs, customary law is very important in international law. And the third source is also state practice, which is linked with customs, but state practice is at the beginning of the, of the customs. If uh, state practice uh, is practiced for a longer time, then uh, might uh, s such uh, practice can uh, be made uh, became uh, international custom as a uh, real source of international law. In um, indifference to national law, international law is also not in practice and not in, not also in theory a perfect law. National law should be perfect law. There should not be gaps in, or there are no gaps in national law system. So to say, if there are no real, uh, real norms um, adopted by the parliament laws and other norms, then uh, these gaps are filled uh, with principles and also judicial precedents. So that in general, uh, there is, uh, if uh, there is a, um, um, principle that um, national law is uh, always uh, perfect and uh, it uh, normally in, in uh, nowadays it is uh, built by norms which are adapted by democratically elected uh, or responsible institutions of, of course by parliament also by government by self-governments, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there could, should not be um, a situation where a lawyer uh, is saying this uh, problem, or this, there is a specific problem, there is a problem, but we have no solution in our law, law, uh, legal system. And in national law, uh, it is not possible in principle, in general, in theory. And uh, if a lawyer is saying, there is no solution for this issue, that means he is a bad lawyer. So, but, uh, but uh, in uh, international law, the situation is different. Uh, international law is not perfect, 
because if we want to have a perfect international law system, then we should have also a world government or world parliament or, uh, so to say, a, a common uh, institution which is uh, behind uh, uh, the international law. And uh, it is uh, some uh, utopic proposals that we should have a uh, world government. Also some are interpreting, for example, that United Nations are um, world government, but in practice it is not so and I think we can put away this idea. So uh, that means there is a community of states and uh, we have in the world uh, 193 three recognized states and uh, maybe so 15 non-recognized entities which are claiming to be states. Uh, you know some examples for such entities? You know? Kosovo, what? Kosovo. Kosovo is a borderline case because it's partially recognized, partially not, but uh, it's already very good, good uh, uh, answer in this direction, but uh, there are uh, some also entities which are um, which are uh, not uh, in, in, in all recognized. For example, uh, very uh, little known, but very uh, in principle good functioning state, not recognized state, but also in in our on our radar is not there. Is Somaliland in the northern parts of so, uh, Somalia uh, with the capital Hargeisa. It is a peaceful state, uh, in difference to the southern part of Somali, and uh, exporting, importing goods, but um, it's not recognized by any other state or international organization. So, but anyway, there are uh, so uh, quite uh, less than 200 states, and uh, the only one international organization where uh, is uh, United Nations, which is uh, uniting all, or quite all, uh, uh, recognized states in the world with. Uh, there are other international organizations too, but uh, United Nations are uh, representing, um, so to say, the quasi-political organization of the world. So to say, a little bit state-like, but of course very far away from, from, uh, from the state. <coughs> and because we uh, don't have, uh, we, we don't have um, uh, the state which could uh, be the basis for a legal system, therefore the international law uh, is of course uh, a legal system, but it is weaker in comparison with national law. And the weakness uh, is exp uh, express uh, himself in two directions. First, there are uh, really questions which could not uh, be answered uh, on, uh, on the basis of the current international law. So to say new questions and because uh, the custom is not there, uh, there are no uh, international agreements. And uh, then, of course, uh, state practice, practice could give the first preliminary answer. So, uh, but the weakest point in international law that uh, there is uh, no uh, real or strong uh, mechanism which executes law. And this is also uh, the main difference with national law system because if uh, the state is not exec ex executing the law, then it became a fake state, it only to claim the ideal state, but if uh, uh, a state is weak and cannot execute the laws, then uh, it becomes, uh, let's say, non-functional state. But we are not saying that uh, the international law is not functioning, we are saying it functions by this system, uh, but international uh, uh, execution of uh, in, in execution of international law is uh, not guaranteed. There is also uh, a saying. Uh, I don't know where who has <laughs> said that. There is no international law, with exception there is someone which executes it. 
Uh, that means one state or some states could execute. And if uh, there are no such states which is willing to execute, then there is no international law. But well, it is a little bit exaggerated because we have also international courts. Uh, uh, the main and the most prominent international court is uh, International Court of Justice, established by United Nations, uh, and is uh, which uh, uh, the seat is in in Hague. And uh, the International Court of Justice uh, is uh, has a specific competence which is attribu attributed to, to uh, this uh, ICG. And um, the judgments or the, the judgments of uh, International Court of Justice are uh, really uh, contributing to building international law. Uh, also, it's uh, very important, it is more important that in national law that a court is uh, building uh, law, as I say, is also a national system, but uh, by International Court of Justice, uh, it is a main, as a very important source of international law. There are also international courts, uh, International Criminal Court, for example, also in Hague, uh, with a specific competence, uh, but international court in principle are also courts uh, which are established by international organizations like European Court of Human Rights, a regional international court, um, also uh, International Court of Justice by, uh, by uh, um, European Court of Justice, I, <laughs> excuse me. So the uh, European Court of Justice established by European Union and, and uh, different uh, others. There are, uh, there is a, in, in uh, New York, uh, there is a Brandeis University, a uh, very small university, but uh, which is specialized in, uh, Europe, in uh, international law. And uh, they have uh, counted more than 100 uh, international courts or court-like uh, institutions. For example, U.S., Iranian, Claim, Commission, and, and so on and so on. So, um, so we have uh, this uh, system. Um, then, of course, I will come to a specific issue in international law, uh, the um, problem of war. Uh, in interne the in modern international law was established maybe in the 17th century, and since then is developing more and more dense than, than previously. But at the beginning, it was uh, clear that uh, war belongs to politics. War belongs to to the existence of state uh, of states, and therefore it was natural that there was a right to war of the states. There were certain principles how to begin the war, how to end the war, uh, but uh, the war belongs uh, to, to, to daily life, and uh, there <coughs> was not necessary specific justification and so on. It was only, let's say, the right like other natural rights, right to war. Um, um, uh, this was um, therefore, therefore but because it was not only since the 17th, 16th or 17th centuries since the establishment of the modern international law. Modern means 300 years old, I mean. Um, <clears throat> but it was throughout the human history. War belongs to life as a natural catastrophe for, for, for people, but uh, it was accepted. It, uh, first, uh, there was some, some uh, um, uh, efforts to, uh, to establish some rules how to, uh, how to um, execute the war, the right to, to war. For example, in Latvian constitution, there is uh, one, uh, one provision which uh, is uh, saying something on that. You know that? In Latvian constitution. Uh, in the Latvian constitution, there is a provision that the president declares the war. So, uh, so, uh, so I should stay here 
and formally declare the war. This is, uh, this is a perception of uh, then international law, that the sh a war should be declared first. And then there are other rules. And also how the war uh, can end. There were also rules and uh, with a peace treaty. You know that the peace treaty after the Second World War was uh, never concluded. And uh, so formally, uh, the war is still ongoing from this point of view. So um, uh, then uh, the convention of uh, uh, 1907, uh, Hay Convention, some restrictions on, uh, on uh, the, uh, how to, how to, how to uh, execute uh, the war. But uh, there was a big change after the First, uh, 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 first uh, World War. So uh, then it was uh, the first, not very uh, consequent, but the first uh, um, mm, agreements which uh, forbid the war. And this is absolutely in the contrary to the all human history. Because it, I can say there were thousands of years years uh, where war, war was natural, natural right, and then only since 100 years it is forbidden. It is an absolute revolution in, in the development of international law. But it was uh, not forbidden, uh, so to say, very clearly and internationally. It was forbidden in, in uh, Europe. There was a special agreements like uh, Brian Kellogg Pact and, and uh, others. So, and therefore, it was, by the way, um, not very clear when, uh, after the First uh, World War, uh, 1939, started the Second World War, uh, whether it was really forbidden at the time. I will not go deeper into that. Uh, uh, but um, after the Second World War, then there is a very clear um, the very clear provision that uh, the war is forbidden. And this is uh, Article 2 of uh, United uh, Nations Charter. It forbids aggressive war. It does not uh, for, forbid uh, a war which is justified by defense. And therefore, by, uh, after the Second World War, there, there were several wars. There were more than 100, well, 120 uh, wars in the world. And uh, in order not to, not to uh, be uh, so, so openly against the international law, the state which, uh, states which uh, started the war uh, said always it was justified war. So to say that previously it was not necessary to justify. Now, today, it is necessary to justify with specific reasons. Of course, the reason is, main, uh, main reason is defense of, of the state. Uh, so, um, but uh, since uh, Second World War, uh, aggressive war is uh, forbidden. There is only one uh, precedent uh, after the Second World War and before the Russians, Russia's aggression against Ukraine uh, of uh, an aggressive war. And you know this precedent. You should know. <laughs> So it was 1991, huh? where? Uh, Kuwait, exact, it was Kuwait. Iraq uh, wanted to extinct, to liquidate another state, Kuwait, and uh, this is a clear uh, breach of uh, this uh, um, prohibition of aggressive war. It has also occupied uh, Kuwait, but six months uh, later, um, it, uh, Kuwait was liberated again by uh, by uh, uh, by a coalition of uh, states uh, led by United uh, by um, U.S. So, and the second uh, second uh, precedent is, of course, uh, now we are witnessing Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. 
And it is not w one of the 120 uh, wars uh, which happens after the Second World War, because it is not a border conflict, it is not a civil war, it is a war against, uh, 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 which uh, from one country against another country in order to extinct, to liquidate the other country. It is uh, said openly, uh, for example, Medvedev, uh, the previous president and one of the leaders still uh, of, of uh, uh, Russia is saying, uh, there is no sense for the existence of Ukraine. No one in the world um, needs Ukraine. Therefore, Ukraine should be liquidated. There is an uh, absolutely useless state. And uh, Russia is going to, uh, to liquidate a useless state. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is a, a clear violation of the prohibition of uh, the uh, <coughs> violation of the pro prohibition of an aggressive war. There are two definitions which, which uh, defines um, <coughs> what means aggressive war. <coughs> it is, uh, the first was uh, 1974, the resolution of the General Assembly of United Nations, which defines what means aggression, definition of aggression. Uh, 1974, and the second is uh, recently, uh, 2018, adopted uh, paragraph 8a of uh, the Rome Statute, uh, the Rome Statute, uh, which is a basis uh, for uh, International Criminal Court. We know that at the beginning, in the Rome Statute, uh, the, um, the competence of uh, International Criminal Court uh, has not covered aggressive war. Uh, because uh, the establishment of uh, international, uh, international Criminal Court was, um, so to say, a very, um, there were some hesitations of also uh, different states, including United States, including France, uh, which don't want to be uh, subjugated to uh, international control by their actions, and therefore they're still not parts, not, uh, not uh, member states of uh, Rome statute, but other are. Latvia, for example, is uh, from the beginning a uh, member state of, um, of the Rome statute. But uh, then it was uh, necessary eight years uh, work in, uh, of, uh, uh, on uh, international level to agree on the definition of the war, uh, aggressive war. This is so-called Kampala Declaration. Uh, uh, negotiations on uh, this uh, paragraph started 2010, and it, uh, it was uh, adopted 2018, but it was uh, then uh, uh, 2018. Now, but only, um, I think, 60 states are now uh, parts or, or uh, subscribed, uh, uh, adapted this uh, definition. And of course, uh, there is no Russia between uh, the 60 states, but also not uh, Ukraine for uh, different reasons. Uh, so uh, it is not possible for International Criminal Court at the moment to deal with uh, this um, issue because it's not included in the competence of the International Criminal Court. In the competence, there is uh, included other, uh, there are included um, other provisions of international law. And we see that uh, International Cro uh, Criminal Court um, is active in this case already since the first days of uh, Russian uh, war, of Russian aggression. Um, I think two weeks after um, after um, the beginning of the war, uh, International Criminal Court uh, issued a preliminary uh, order that Russia sh should stop the war. Of course, Russia has not uh, not answered to that, but uh, there is already um, in, uh, International Court which is dealing, but not with uh, the crime of aggression 
but with, in this case, a specific case with a genocide convention for which International Criminal Court is responsible. Uh, there is, uh, um, uh, at the beginning, uh, there was a request of Ukraine to, uh, against um, Russia for a specific, um, in a specific um, constellation of uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine sued Russia for false interpretation of the Genocide Convention in order to get a justification for the aggression against Ukraine. It's a little bit uh, strange, could be, but it was the way how, uh, how um, uh, international co court uh, can, uh, can uh, deal with the question. Uh, so, and uh, international court is, uh, is active in this, and you have uh, seen that also one month ago, international criminal court uh, issued an arrest warrant against uh, President Putin for a specific case for deportation of children. Deportation of children is forbidden by genocide convention. And, uh, and uh, there are evidences enough uh, so that, uh, that uh, Russia is in this case uh, committing um, uh, crime of genocide in this specific case. So, but, um, but there are, uh, but uh, the crime of aggression, uh, for the crime of aggression, there is, uh, for the moment, no international court which would be responsible for this. And therefore, when uh, this is also a practice of international law, if uh, there is uh, no international court which can deal with a specific issue, and if there is the political will of the international community. This is decisive. If there, we can uh, say that there is a political will, then a special tribunal for specific case could be established. And we have uh, the first such uh, special tribunal, it was 1993, uh, special tribunal of Yugoslavia. It was a new precedent before it was not established uh, such kind of tribunals, but then uh, it follows uh, other tribunals, for example, special tribunal for Rwanda, special tribunal for Liberia, special tribunal for uh, Sierra Leone, special tribunal for Cambodia, uh, for a specific one criminal case uh, in Le Lebanon, the murder of the prime minister in Lebanon, specific one crime. <laughs> But it was established a special international tribunal for to investigate this crime. So there is this possibility. It is uh, not uh, satisfactory from the point of view of uh, of legal theory and practice, because uh, establishing of special tribunals there is because there is a political will is always some kind of arbitrariness. In some kind, uh, in some situations, a special tribunal is established. In other, maybe similar or more serious, there is uh, no such a tribunal because uh, there are not enough political will. But um, uh, by uh, a realistic view, I would say that it's better to have such tribunals in uh, some cases as not to have at all. So there is a choice. And then, of course, in, in the same time, we should uh, work on a more um, principle um, solution that in all cases of violation of international law, there should be an international court which can uh, judge the issue. And this is, of course, uh, the natural task would be for international criminal court in Hague. And therefore, by the discussion, by the proposal to establish a special uh, ad hoc tribunal for, um, for this case, uh, some scholars and, uh, are saying uh, we should work uh, to um, 
widen the competencies of International Criminal Court. But um, realistically, it is not possible in the next maybe 10, 15, 100 years, because as you know, only to, uh, to uh, include a definition of aggression, of aggressive war, it took eight years. It was at the time not an actual issue. It was only a theor theoretical issue because actually between 2010 and 2018 there was no actual case. But it took eight years. But to, uh, to widen uh, the competence of International Criminal Court, we should work on that. And Latvia is also working on that. But uh, of course, we cannot wait next 10 or 15 or, or 50 years for that. So there is therefore a proposal to establish such a tribunal. Uh, why it is necessary? And uh, I would say it is necessary uh, not only for the justice for Ukraine. It is necessary in order to preserve international law. I come back to the sources of international law. And there are three sources, inter, uh, international agreements, customary law, and state practice. Uh, if we can see that uh, the good precedent was the only one precedent, it was 1991 uh, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And there was immediately a reaction of international community which remedied the situation. That is, that is a confirmation of the rule of international law, uh, law that aggressive war is forbidden. It was a confirmation. Now we have a second case of the, sec of the Second World War. Uh, and uh, there should be also a reaction of international law. If there is no reaction, then we can say uh, that uh, uh, the states have accepted uh, this uh, behavior. And it would uh, mean that the already reached standard of international law by, uh, by the prohibition of aggression war will fall back. And therefore, in order to preserve the international law, we should judge this specific issue also because it's only one in the world at the moment. There are still ongoing wars in the world. But this is specific war. This is the only one aggressive war accordingly to the both definitions or the third, uh, three definitions. Um, United Nations Charter, uh, elaborated definition 1974 resolution, and also uh, paragraph 8a of the Rome Statute. In abstracto, definition is there. What uh, is lacking is a court which can deal with the issue. There are also other arguments that um, uh, it is not realistic that, uh, that um, the leadership of Russia will really brought to, to Hague. Uh, but uh, I think it is uh, not a valid argument. Uh, there are different criminals which are hiding or escaping, and therefore we are not abolishing the court system, we are not abolishing the police, uh, because uh, some are hiding and it is not possible to get them. Uh, so this is uh, not, an, not a uh, valid argument. Um, I would say that uh, for, uh, for uh, <coughs> it is necessary in the first place, uh, for international law to guard international law. Because this, uh, uh, the prohibition of war is now the legal basis of world peace. Uh, the peace order is based on international law, which includes as a very prominent uh, position prohibition of aggressive war. Um, so, and for this reason, uh, I said already, it is uh, in the history absolutely unique and unusual. Normal situation is a right to war, thousands of years. Only in the last 100 years there is a prohibition. And then we should not fall, fall back in the situation before uh, First World War, 
uh, than uh, when uh, the war was a uh, so, so normal, uh, normal mean, normal tool of politics. Um, so, how to establish it? Now, there are different, um, different options. And in principle, of course, the best option, it would be by United, United Nations. A Security Council is blocked because of the veto power of Russia. Uh, then, uh, now, it is clear that in general, I would say, that the um, competence and the power within the United Nations is, is uh, slowly shifting from, from Security Council to uh, General Assembly. It's also more democratic. You know that since 20 years there are negotiations on reform of United Nations, how to overcome the situation which was, re which was reasonable 1945, but now today is not more reasonable. But uh, of course, without, um, it is not possible uh, without um, uh, agreement with uh, veto powers. So, uh, it is possible by uh, United Nations um, resolution to establish uh, such a tribunal. Uh, there are other possibilities also we should not exclude it. For example, by other international organizations, by uh, Council of Europe, by, Euro uh, by uh, European Union, because it's interesting that the parliamentary assembly, as a political body of, in, of, uh, of uh, Council of Europe, uh, voted already in April 22 for the establishment of such a tribunal. And now we have also a very strong resolution of the European Parliament from January of this year, which also voted for the establishment of uh, establishing of uh, such a tribunal. So two very important regional organizations, regional, European, are for uh, their political will to establish such a tribunal. But the political will is like, like in many cases, it's in principle good, but not by us. By you, <laughs> so, and um, of course, uh, but in, uh, but it could also be uh, established by um, United, uh, by Council of Europe, or by uh, by uh, European Union, or simply by agreement, international agreement of uh, several states. Maybe ten or fifty states could uh, could agree on uh, with, in an international agreement to establish such a tribunal. Definition is there. I think this is very important. We should not look for a new definition. Definition is already there, but uh, only the court is uh, missing. Uh, why it is better for by to establish such a tribunal by United Nations? Because uh, if it would be established by uh, by a treaty between several states or by international organizations like regional organizations or European, then of course <coughs> it would also on the same time contribute to fragmentation of international law. That means, uh, for example, 10 states can agree to establish such a tribunal. Um, but then of course Russia and North Korea and Eritrea could also establish a tribunal to judge European Union and, and, and other states. So uh, it would be a war of tribunals. Therefore, I think I would not exclude this situation. Uh, it is maybe better than doing nothing, nothing, but uh, we should first look, uh, uh, try to establish this by United Nations. And uh, United Nations, in United Nations there is an initiative to, to in this direction. And Latvia is uh, very active in, 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 in this uh, um, process. Um, on the uh, level of ambassadors in New York, uh, uh, more than 40 states are working uh, for a uh, uh, United Nations General Assembly resolution uh, how to establish such a tribunal. There are in principle two models. The first model is a real uh, international tribunal. The other model is a hybrid tribunal. Uh, 
I would also add that uh, I mentioned several uh, international uh, ad hoc tribunals, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and so on. Each case is different. There is no one model uh, for uh, such uh, in, uh, ad hoc tribunals. And that means uh, international uh, law is creative. Uh, so if there is a new situation, uh, international lawyers or the states are finding a new solution. We should not stick to uh, that was already uh, uh, was uh, previously, because international law, as each uh, legal system, uh, is uh, a living instrument, as uh, international uh, European Court of Justice, uh, not uh, human rights, is saying, but um, but uh, also one of the main sources of development of international law is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the state pra practice, but also. Uh, such kind of resolutions. So, uh, what would be the difference between the two models? The real international tribunal uh, would consist of um, of international judges. Judges, first. Second, it would be uh, placed, or uh, the, uh, the seat would be uh, outside Ukraine, somewhere maybe in Hague. Uh, Netherlands already offered. A seat in Hague, like, uh, and uh, there was, would be special rules of uh, procedure um, for this court. Special rules of procedure. Uh, it would be not very difficult to establish such a rules because uh, a model rule could be international uh, criminal courts uh, rules of procedure. It's very similar procedure, but in principle different. Uh, procedural rules, and uh, this was, would be a real international court uh, within, which is embedded in international law, and also as a judgment of international, of such an international tribunal would immediately uh, have an impact to international law. The other uh, proposal which is discussed is hybrid tribunal. Uh, there are also precedents for such uh, hybrid tribunals, for example, Cambodia, um, where uh, this is, is in principle uh, work, um, in principle uh, national tribunal, in this case Ukrainian tribunal, in which will um, deal with the issue, issues uh, accordingly with Ukrainian national procedural rules but with certain international elements. For example, some international judges or, uh, and uh, I would say some specific rules and uh, maybe the seat outside Ukraine. Uh, this is not a real international tribunal, and, um, but it would be some kind of, um, of compromise between national tribunal Ukrainian tribunal and of course Ukraine and uh, other each other international uh, each other country is entitled to entitled to open proceedings now also Latvia because we have also international crimes in our in our criminal code but uh, the sense would be less uh, because we want to uh, guard especially international law and if Latvia would also judge, it's also good. But uh, the impact of Latvian court uh, judgment to international law would be much more less than the specific international tribunal. Therefore, but of course there are some um, um, political uh, arguments uh, because uh, I state, uh, said already that the states are hesitant uh, to establish such uh, such a tribunal, because uh, because what I said today is the view uh, of uh, a state which is committed to international law. But we can see that uh, there are 193 states in the world, and uh, not for all states international law has uh, such a 
high uh, level of importance by political decision making. I discussed recently with uh, one of my colleagues um, a different issue, not, not this uh, Russian issue, but uh, it, I was a little bit, uh, so to say, uh, surprised that he, he said, for political reasons, we should do so and so and so. Uh, I said, but it would be contrary to international law. Yes, uh, it would be contrary, but uh, there are other reasons why we can overcome the law. Uh, for um, states which are using rule of law principles as a main principle of uh, state order, it is impossible to say, of course, it's against the law, but we are doing for other reasons, for to guard our interests and so on. And I think uh, this attitude to international law, what be in Europe or the West in general, but also outside the West, uh, have uh, uh, concerning the international law is not automatically valid for other countries or for all countries in the world. And therefore also this is a source for the hesitations. So uh, I will uh, conclude now uh, with, um, so to say, with um, some words on the current situation. In the current situation, we have uh, the process in New York. Uh, we will see whether uh, such a tribunal would be established. There are still di two options, Latvia and, uh, uh, and other states uh, for real international tribunal. Uh, there are other uh, group of states which, uh, which are for hybrid tribunal, I said, because uh, why international tribunal is better. But uh, we will see also hybrid tribunal would also be second best solution uh, because the worst solution is that there would be not an answer of a, on the level of international law. So uh, there, is, uh, there are other uh, issues which should be solved uh, by international law, uh, especially uh, the issue of damages, reparations. And uh, in this issue, there is also already some, some movements. Uh, the Council of Europe established a special bureau in Hague, a register of damages, so to say each person can uh, send, uh, send uh, I will stop, uh, send uh, some um, evidences, uh, for example, that uh, his house is destroyed um, to Hague, to this register. Uh, there is also a prosecutor office established by a European um, uh, Union, which is collaborating with them. So to say, there is already some uh, lower level institutions which are dealing with the problem of reparations. And the main issue is now also uh, on, uh, on the table by European Union, by Western countries. There are uh, billions of dollars of Russian property uh, which are seized. And now the next stage is to confiscate them and to uh, give to Ukraine for reparation of the damages. You remember, um, you don't remember, but you know that uh, Germany uh, paid a very long time uh, reparations for other countries. And it's of course also a responsibility, international responsibility of Russia to pay damages uh, after, after the war. And uh, we will have also this specific, uh, specific mechanism and um, European Commission is working uh, on that. Uh, I think in May uh, there should be a report how many, uh, what, uh, what uh, assets uh, are seized in all 27 member states. We will count it together and then we can see uh, we, how we can go further. Dear colleagues, I will stop here. Uh, we can uh, then discuss the issues. I uh, try to explain uh, how uh, this uh, Russian uh, war against Ukraine uh, is uh, 
embedded in in international law system, what could be the answer and what uh, is uh, the situation now, especially uh, concerning the political will to give the right answer. And uh, Latvia is very active in this, uh, in uh, searching and uh, forming uh, of this answer. And uh, we will see the result, but uh, I am uh, confident that some kind of result there would be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. For this tour de force, it means it was a very good mapping, actually, of the process. From my perspective, it was in the three la layers, let's say. The normative, it means institutional and political. That is a not only <coughs> static, but dynamic presentation of the issue of the, of the international responsibility of, of uh, Russian Federation nowadays. And I want to open the floor for the questions and answers. Anybody wants to ask the question? Yes, please. Good morning, President. Uh, it's an honor to be here in front of you. Thank you for your speech. Uh, we've heard in previous uh, talks before with previous lectures about the role that Latvia is playing towards uh, contributing to the international community. We've heard that it's probably in the workings uh, with the convention in regards to human protection of human rights in the cyberspace. I would like to ask you how optimistic you are about the role that your country is playing towards the prevention of future crimes from other crimes that we've seen arise with the uh, cyber attacks and prevention of incitation of wars through the internet. Yes. So, um, Latvia um, has now a very big army in comparison with uh, other states. Uh, but uh, the ideas and the good arguments, it is uh, not necessary to have a, a very a big army. So um, I think uh, we are thinking about uh, not only on our country, but also uh, on uh, international environment, including legal environment, especially European Union, but also other, uh, other uh, layers of international environment like United Nations and so on. And I see uh, really that uh, now is uh, time uh, to go much more deeper in, uh, in cyberspace, which is a new, new issue um, in, in, in international law, is only the beginning of uh, the development of this area. Um, we are working uh, very actively also within the European Union because the European Union is, uh, has also, I would say, so-called um, standard setting power. Uh, we are setting, as a European Union, uh, standards in different areas, also cyber area. A digital area, and then the other states, because uh, European Union together has a certain economic and political power in the global world, uh, they are following us. For example, the GDPR uh, was uh, set uh, first by European Union, and then the other countries adopted uh, the principles of GDPR. So, and now I think it's time for uh, other uh, solutions, like, for example, Digital Service Act, and uh, Digital Market Act, and uh, because if uh, American companies uh, want to be here present, they should uh, obey these uh, two uh, directives, and, um, and uh, that means that there are repercussions to the behavior of these companies in the U.S. Also, on this, uh, on this way, uh, we are within the European Union very active. I, I, uh, it's also my field of interest. I, uh, I think uh, Digital Service Act uh, was a big step, principal step forward, because it's the first time in the world that uh, big uh, tech companies are regulated. The regulation is in principle um, is going in the right direction with uh, some exceptions. For example, I don't agree from the point of view of uh, democracy that uh, the censorship, internet censorship, is uh, we are committing a private company, not in Europe, but in US, in California, to censor our public, public debate. I think it is 
very, uh, uh, so to say, doubtful from the point of view of the rule of law and democracy. Uh, we can uh, we can see maybe we can um, we can go before the European Court of Justice with this issue. It's of course uh, European regulation, and European Court of Justice uh, can can uh, examine it. Uh, so this is one point. But anyway, these are uh, there are discussions, and now. Um, um, the very fast uh, development of artificial intelligence, uh, chat GPT, and now there are other um, other um, tools. Um, we cannot see uh, the repercussions to other repercussions to economy and so on. Uh, they are not so problematic, but to democracy, to the autonomy of the people, to to um, to the possibility to influence um, the perception of the people, the perception, uh, perception of reality. And I think uh, there is an issue which we should, uh, uh, where we should look closer. Uh, there is already a proposal of uh, European Commission uh, how to regulate uh, these uh, new tools, uh, but I think um, it's a relatively weak reg regulation because the starting point, in my view, is not uh, the real problem. The real problem is this uh, um, poss possibility to manipulate the perception of the world. This is the problem, real problem. But uh, they are starting in with a low level problem with uh, patents because they are maybe violating copyright. Of course, maybe. But it's not the main issue in this case. So, but we will see. And Latvia is also very active in this field. Thank you. Can we time for the next uh, question, please? Thank you, Mr. President, for the lecture. Uh, my question is as follows. Uh, what is your opinion uh, from your point of view? How do you think why the uh, Russia's occupation of Crimea and Donbass in 2014 didn't lead to to immediate harsh reaction of the European uh, community and the Western community in general. And uh, depending on your question, uh, what do you think if, uh, if those, uh, uh, if the reaction uh, was, uh, some steps were similar to, to the current ones, would it prevent uh, the, us from, from, from Russia's invasion of 2020? Yeah, it was a clear failure. Uh, because the perception of Russia in uh, in uh, in the West was wrong, they have not uh, seen the increasingly aggressive character of Russia uh, by uh, the introduction of a new old ideology, which is uh, which is an aggressive ideology, and of course. Um, uh, which is uh, directed also against democracy, against the West as a enemy in general. And 2008, the first aggression against Georgia, then 2014, the first uh, um, aggression against Ukraine, and then 2022, the full-scale aggression. Uh, now the West has learned, but it was uh, relatively late, I would say. Uh, for the Baltics, for Latvia, we know Russia better, and therefore we have already learned that it would be. Because uh, Russia, 2008 and 2014, learned a, lec uh, a lecture, a lesson. And the lesson was, the West is weak, also we can go further. Now it's clear that uh, 2022, uh, the West has recognized there is a danger, and uh, there is a, the answer is uh, right to support Ukraine, to strengthen NATO, especially eastern flank. But now we have uh, the situation today, and uh, I think we should do all possible that uh, Ukraine could win the war, because if uh, Russia will uh, benefit from the war, then also the lesson would be the West is weak. Also, we can try further. But not only that, because in this time, 
uh, it could, uh, could have not only European uh, repercussions, but also global repercussions, because uh, China is very carefully looking what happens in Ukraine. Uh, China has also um, developed some, some aggressive attitudes, and uh, they will see uh, if Russia uh, will win the war. That means also free hand for China, because China will learn also the lesson the West is weak, US is weak, also we can go further. First time, of course, uh, is Taiwan, a democratic country. Uh, so therefore, it is uh, strategically very important also to support Ukraine and to strengthen NATO so that this uh, lesson uh, would not be, um, this conclusion uh, would not be uh, drawn by, 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 by Russia. And I think we, we have this time uh, we have, uh, as we as the West, we have the uh, on the light, right conclusions. Next question. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Nice seeing you again. Um, thank you for a very uh, or hugely interesting and perhaps thought-provoking, or should I say, thought-stimulating lecture. I have two quick questions. I, I am aware of the time. Uh, the first one being, um, you mentioned, of course, and we all know that uh, the United States is not a signatory to the Rome Statute. And I was wondering whether that, that has any implications on the legitimacy of the ongoing discussions on establishing an, an international court. And also, uh, uh, you deliberated um, at length about the differences between a hybrid uh, uh, court and an uh, international sort of proper court. What would be the rationale for European states, because we know that also within the EU there are states, member states, that argue for a hybrid court. What's their rationale? Is it out of... Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> the Rome statutes are not uh, signed by all uh, by all states in the world, but also by more or less a half, I think, huh? 90 or what? Yeah. So, and uh, some important states like, uh, like uh, US and, and France have not signed uh, for the reasons that because they don't want to have a supervisory <laughs> uh, in concerning their actions because uh, they, are, uh, they want to have be fully free from uh, some kind of, of uh, supervision, international supervision. Uh, of course, uh, such kind of international uh, supervision mechanism is important in general for all countries, uh, including them, but uh, more uh, for uh, middle powers and, and smaller states, <coughs> because uh, unil unilateral action on a global basis is only imaginable for some big countries and therefore they don't want it. So, but it is uh, not a question of legitimacy. I think uh, legitimacy, because the legitimacy is based uh, on, uh, on uh, the arguments, why it is necessary, and then of course uh, the arguments why some states are not uh, signatures, uh, states, uh, member states of the Rome Statute, they are very weak arguments. I mentioned the real argument. Maybe they can be expressed more, more diplomatic way, but this is the core of the argument. It's a weak argument. And therefore, it is uh, not a question of uh, legitimacy. So, and um, the second question was... Uh, for the hybrid tribunal. It is also some, uh, some um, I would say, uh, problem of perception or uh, fear so uh, that um, international to establish an international tribunal I said already it is necessary uh, for the reason of the case in Ukraine but also for international law and uh, the hybrid tribunal is um, there is uh, I would say um, maybe some uh, thinking we should at the end agree with uh, Russia on, on, uh, the, on the division of Ukraine and so on, maybe to give uh, formally uh, Donbass and Crimea and so on. And I think uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking is maybe uh, in, unintentionally there. 
and uh, I would say that uh, it is uh, not a valid not a valid argument. If we want to really contribute to international law development, we should uh, establish a real, uh, uh, real uh, international tribunal. Uh, it would be <coughs> also some work necessary by international lawyers how to, uh, how to um, mm, argue on uh, on uh, the impact of hybrid tribunal to international law. It would be possible, but it would be, it would, um, be necessary more intellectual efforts. So to say that yeah, Ukrainian principle, Ukrainian court with international elements has the same impact as, as a real international court. Uh, so also I would say weak argument, but still there. We've got a, just a two minutes, a sh short question to this lady over there. Thank you, thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask a little bit broader question about the system of international law and the situation. But the mentioning of the quote of international law works when the countries follow it. So with the situation of Russia using international law language to justify all of this and to continuously say that, oh, they have the responsibility to protect and using this language all the time, is this maybe show some trend of even countries that don't seem to want to follow international law to still use it as a tool and how it is that really impact? Yes. Yes, it is so. It's really so since 100 years. Maybe 200 years ago, it was, uh, so to say, one king said, we will attack the neighboring country. It was normal and acceptable. Today, to say, really, it's an it's a absolute exception, as uh, Russia's uh, leadership is saying this. They are acting or saying something uh, like they are living 200 years ago. Uh, I, I quoted from Medvedev, it was uh, 200 years ago, it would be normal. Today, it's uh, very, very strange, maybe psychopathic. But, <clears throat> but uh, in general, the language of international law and also the language of democracy is, uh, is accepted. So it's, uh, there are very rare regimes which are saying we are not democratic. For example, uh, North Korea's uh, name is Korean Democratic People's Republic. Also, even North Korea. Uh, are saying, is saying no, uh, democrat, uh, that they have democracy. But of course, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, masquerade, I would say, is uh, usual, and, um, but uh, the core, we can, uh, we can uh, 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 by using certain categories to discover whether it is real or it is, uh, it is um, a manipulation. And therefore, it is. Uh, therefore, it's very, very uh, first time I would say in international court system that this kind of problem, which you raised, and now before the International uh, Court of Justice, I said that uh, Ukraine has sued Russia for false interpretation of genocide convention in order to establish a justification for the war. You see, that's very complicated. Uh, it was never before such kind of, uh, of uh, claim in international uh, court. It would be also not only in this case interesting, but also very interesting from the point of view of legal theory. So that the false interpretation of a norm could lead to a responsibility. So uh, therefore, it's a very precise question. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. Not only for this lecture, but yeah. also for being with us for 25 years. Yeah. Right? So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. Paul Diaz, that this is Labiums. Labiums, it's us. Yeah. Ah, microphone. Labiums. <laughs> <laughs>